Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham, coming at you today nearly live. We are in Cambridge, Massachusetts, talking about a sort of signature event that happened in the United States in the early part of the 21st century. It's the, the Enron fiasco. And our guest today wrote his PhD dissertation and ha- will have a forthcoming book from the University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, currently works at Boston University in the writing program there, and it's Gavin Benke. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. When I asked you to come on the show, in one of my emails, I think I mentioned that I saw a play about Enron yeah. last year, which was an hour too long, I felt, and, and kind of really over the top and being super negative about Enron. So I, I'm interested to talk to someone who knows a little more of the factual story of, of what happened. But before we get into that, I want to talk yeah. a little bit just about your academic background. Sure. Because it's, it's very interesting, your track, mm-hmm. from how you, how you went through school, because you started at Georgetown mm-hmm. in D.C., M.A. at the University of Virginia. In English, yeah. And then to the University of Texas mm-hmm. in Austin, the hipster capital of the world <laughs> at, at this point. Uh, yeah. Well, also a booming, I guess, like tech right. tech spot now. Right. But yeah. And then to Tampa for a postdoc mm-hmm. at... University S- of South Florida. South Florida. And then SMU in Dallas yeah. for a year. And now you're at Boston University. So it, it seems as though the outlier of all those places, to me, would be Boston, just geographically. Yeah. That, that it doesn't necessarily fit with the other places. But for you, what has that process been like and, and getting to live in so many different places for schools and, and at different types of school, like Georgetown, a small private school, mm-hmm. University of Texas at Austin, a huge state school. Like you, you've really seen the gamut yeah. of universities. Been, it's been interesting. There's definitely some sort of connection in every single school to its location right. in kind of unique ways. When I was in Georgetown, and this was in the late 90s, and Bill Clinton was president and he was an alumnus... There was just this sense of like politics you were around, and it made sense for the city. Um, UVA has this completely like storied past with the South and, and the English department there. You know, William Faulkner had been there for a little while, and they wow. had um, a monograph copy of uh, The Sound and the Fury and their special collections, and Jefferson had built the place, and sort of steeped in that kind of sensibility. Hmm. UT, again, there's just such a connection to... Well, about, the thing that struck yeah. me about UT when, yeah. when I was there, and, and we didn't stop on campus at all. We, we stopped at the State House in yeah. Austin. But you're going along the interstate, going, and we were going south, mm-hmm. and you just see that football stadium. Oh, yeah, like, for It sure. just comes up on you, and it's very clear. And, and I, the University of Texas, as far as I know, is a pretty well-regarded academic institution. Mm-hmm. But I think the way in which most people would interact with the University of Texas around the country is through football. And the understanding that I have about the University of Texas is that sort of football comes first, at least socially and culturally, that that football team is so central to what happens around campus. They had this number at one point, I think I heard on the radio when I was there, that like the, the amount of tax revenue generated by one home game was just astonishing. It's there, but honestly, when I think about like football cultures, UVA pops out way more. Okay, um, you know, alumni would just drive in from everywhere, right. and I, they don't have. I mean, UT Stadium holds, I think, over a hundred thousand people. Yeah, UVA's didn't, but game day at UVA, it would be just jam packed trying to get into Charlottesville before the game. Easiest driving while the game was going on. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. That's when you're going to the grocery store. Yeah, exactly. That's when you're doing your stuff, yeah. Um, but the craziest thing is you could, it would be silent out. Um, because no one would really be on the roads or anything. You could hear these roars from the stadium when something happens. <laughs> so you're sort of really aware, mm-hmm. even though I think, yeah, UT's football team is far more iconic. Yeah. Um, one thing about UT or Austin, which I thought was interesting, is having spent some time in Houston and some time in Dallas, Austin is so different from the rest of Texas. Uh, you get a sense that people who felt growing up in Texas not quite not quite a part of wherever they were, mm-hmm. um, they don't think of leaving Texas um, as they feel Texan in their blood. Right. But they Austin pulls all of them. So you right. have these people from Texas who 
have sort of an interesting relationship with the state hmm. kind of hanging out there. And that's, but, that's really yeah. interesting because it does have that reputation, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's almost like if there was a place that would have, say, a Democratic mayor in yeah. Texas, you would guess that it would be in Austin. Yeah, for thing, sure. Right? It's that little sort of blue enclave. If there is a blue enclave in Texas, you would think it'd be in Austin. But at the same um, time, it's deeply Texan. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's a, it is a fascinating, fascinating place. And, and then, South Florida and, and Tampa is the reputation. Tampa has uh-huh. the reputation of sort of being not the most exciting place in the world. Yeah, uh, and yet you have this big school mm-hmm. with a lot of young people that, to me, doesn't mesh with the reputation of Tampa of being a place where cruise ships stop and old people are. You know, to, to me, that's the I think the face of what Tampa is. And yet you have this big school. Yeah. And a lot of college kids there. Yeah, there are a lot of college kids there. It's tr- sort of... When I was there, it was transitioning to uh, to more of a four-year institution. But when you're around town in Tampa, a lot of people are USF graduates. Mm-hmm. And it's a commuter school. So this is a really strong connection between Tampa as a place in that school. Um, a lot of the Hillsborough County Community College students end up transferring into mm. uh, USF. So it's a a school that definitely is just really tightly linked to the city and providing um, a real service for that for that city. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's that's fantastic, too. And there's the links between the two are are stronger in some ways Mm -hmm. than, say, like UVA, which is situated in Charlottesville and is Charlottesville, I'm sure, biggest employer. Mm -hmm. But it's also something that's sort of like part in some ways from charlottesville right ut austin uh, if you think of austin as sort of this multi-nodal city where you've got the state house there you've got dell and sort of a growing tech yeah. industry and then you've got ut it's one of many big players right. in the city usf felt really integrated mm-hmm. in a way that was that was different right. at the same time tampa itself is kind of a strange City. I thought the weather was beautiful, and you'd have like great access to wonderful beaches and stuff. Yeah. But in a lot of ways, it was sort of a depressed, dying city. Mm. Um, we lived around the corner from the strip mall, and just the two years we were there, you would see like businesses just sort of close up and right, right, right. and go away. Yeah, and and when I I've been in Tampa a couple times, and the last time was to go to a, a Lightning game when mm-hmm. I was in Orlando for uh, on a golf trip that one night we drove out to Tampa to go to the, a lightning game. Yeah. And yeah, you kind of felt walking around downtown, like, like once you got like two blocks away from this, the building, mm-hmm. it was like, well, there's not much going on. Here. Yeah, and for sure. It was sort of interesting. Cause yeah, you would, you would think like a Florida town on the coast would be a little more lively, but it's, it certainly wasn't the case. It wasn't my experience. Yeah. It hasn't figured it out yet. Or mm-hmm. the downtown was, it's interesting because at one point in the mid 20th century, you had these wonderful sort of storefronts, and a lot of them are actually in the historic register. So you can't really knock them down and build new things. You have these beautiful facades to buildings that are totally vacant for blocks and blocks of downtown. Hmm. Um, and you sort of sense this potential that <laughs> yeah. never, right. never really kind of got. Happens. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you, you talk about the link between a, a school and a place, mm-hmm. and then you come to Boston and yeah. to BU and the thing to me that, that stands out about Boston, at least in terms of academics, mm-hmm. is that there are 400 colleges here, or, yeah. or whatever the number. Like, there's a lot of schools here, and several of them have the word Boston yeah, in, for sure. in, in their title. So, have you found your experience at, at BU that, that it's representative of Boston in a way that might be different from certainly my experience being across the river in Cambridge, but from somebody at BC even just given how the school operates. And, and I know the school geographically is mm-hmm. really central Yeah, with, within Boston. Like when I walk to Fenway Park from, from here, mm-hmm. I walk through the BU campus. So it's, it's not downtown, but it's downtown adjacent. And mm-hmm. it's a pretty easy ride on the subway if you choose to take the subway down to Park Street. So geographically, it's really central Boston. Mm-hmm. So have you felt that? 
the school is representative of Boston or does it feel Boston-y in the same way that some of the other places have have felt attached to the city? Yes and no. Um, and I also feel like I want to give props to SMU and the Clement Center yes. Uh, yes. there, which is just this, just a wonderful place for an academic to spend a year. Right. Um, I, yeah, I can't say enough good things about the Clement mm-hmm. Center. Yeah, again, um, the, the, with, <laughs> we'll get back to BU. Okay. SMU, the only connection... I would have to SMU, and, yeah. and not even a connection. Awareness of SMU is when the football team, again, the football team, when they got the death penalty right. uh, for basically cheating, mm-hmm. or the NCAA's version of cheating, which you could argue isn't actually cheating. Yeah. But yeah, but otherwise, you don't have that much connection to it. And the, the reputation of Dallas is a very spread out city. Everyone has a car, and mm-hmm. then SMU, you, you go to campus to do your stuff, and then you leave campus. And that... Because the city's so big and so spread out, mm-hmm. it's not the same as maybe other places where you're really central. Because Dallas doesn't really have a central. D- I mean, Dallas definitely has a downtown. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, Dallas in general is just really spread out and car-centric. And right. SMU feels like a small liberal arts campus that's sort of cloistered. You can see downtown from because it right. sort of sits up on a hill so you can actually see skyscrapers and stuff like that but when you're on the campus you don't feel like you're in a city like you would at, mm. at BU and I was interested in SMU um, Jeff Skilling who was the architect of Enron's Great Transformation went there as an undergraduate and spoke mm. glowingly about uh, SMU so it was interesting to just sort of I thought about that a lot when I was even just sort of walking around the campus right. and, and stuff like that yeah yeah so, but, so yeah it, and but, like you say it's a has a really good reputation and mm-hmm. your experience there you the first time I met you yeah. you were very positive about SMU yeah I, then too like you have nothing but good things to say yeah the SMU the Clement Center is just I'm sure it's it's a lot like the the Weatherhead it's just a mm-hmm. fantastic place to spend a year right. and uh, the other fellows the year I was there and the directors who run the center and the, it's just a really really special place right. and it's hard to quantify that Especially but when you're there, for, like, and I'm sort of running into this now, that you're at a place for one year yeah. that's really good and you have a good time, and then you're gone. And it's like, wow, that just sort of flew by. Like, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and then you wonder, did he just take full advantage of the opportunity to use the resources properly? Yeah. That you, sort of stuff, right? Yeah, you, yeah, you wonder. And in fact, I'm trying to even plan a little quick trip back to Dallas for research mm-hmm. this summer um, because of some new... Some papers that have become recently right. uh, available, but yeah, I mean, getting back to to BU yeah. and stuff, it's interesting because it does feel super integrated with the rest of the city. Mm-hmm. And when I first got there, I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. It's going to be like NYU or um, in Washington D.C. GW is like a downtown campus, right. completely indistinguishable. If you don't know what to look for from the the buildings around right. it, yeah. And when I first got here i thought like oh this is going to be like that and to a certain extent it is you know there's uh stops along the t that have like bu west bu central bu east but at the same time i guess i'm just habituated to it so i in my head there's like a really clear demarcation of when the city ends and the campus stops now um but i think that's just because of sort of my walking routine and Right, and, and you're so, sort of, you're and you're probably more aware of the yeah. space than someone who isn't a faculty member at BU or a student at BU. Yeah, exactly. Be, right, and for me, when I'm walking mm-hmm. to Fenway, and, yeah, and, and walking down whatever street that is that I walk down to get to the BU Bridge, um, yeah, I I can tell when I'm on campus. Yeah, like I can tell that moment when you cross over from not being on campus to being on campus. Yeah. Which with the bridge is really easy. Yeah, sure. You know, there's a bridge. But when you walking from Fenway back towards BU, to me it's a very clear moment. Because no other fans are walking that way. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like all the fans, if if you've been to Fenway, you have to cross over the Mass Pike yeah. to get back to the T mm-hmm. uh, or, or to downtown or wherever you're going. And so most fans, you, you walk over the, the Mass Pike, the bridge, and turn right yeah. to get to the T. If you're going towards BU, you turn left. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it's not you're not that far from the stadium, but the crowd is basically gone. Yeah. Right? And you're on campus, and it's like it's almost like that, that campus is like a barrier that 
other fans aren't going to cross over. I guess not. So it's 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 a really interesting division to me. Yeah, and and I'm very aware of when that happens. So it is an urban campus, but, but there is a, a my experience has been there's a demarcation there when you're on campus and not. It's interesting too because all the the BU stops on the T are above ground, and then right. so the last one is Kenmore. Yeah, and then it goes underground. If you just get out at the very next stop, which is Heinz Convention Center, mm-hmm. it feels very different. Right. Right away, it feels... Even though there's like a clump of the Mass Arts Colleges are around there, and mm-hmm. um, Boston Architectural College is right there, yeah. and Berkeley, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it already feels like much more of a jumble. And I think just BU mm-hmm. is such a massive school. I think it just it just dominates that area. Yeah. Um, it changes. Like, the character of that neighborhood changes on game day, though. All of a sudden, there's this whole other right. crowd of people, yeah. you know, all wearing their, you know, yeah, like if you sock were, stuff and like if you live, say, around Park Street or you were mm-hmm. at Park Street and you had a seven o'clock class in the spring, yeah, for instance, you would hate the Red Sox, probably because it's just so like the Green Line. I hate the Green Line anyway, but on game days, it's just so hard to get out on the Green Line. Yeah, and it's just packed and awful and. Yeah, so I could see how the the neighborhood would change because I've been down there on non game days, mm-hmm. going to Fenway Park, but on non game days, and yeah, it does have a very different vibe. Yeah, as to as opposed to when the team is there, and, and I'm sure students would notice that. I'm sure they do. Then again, I've seen some. I've you know, in the fall I was teaching, I got done at five o'clock, and so I, a couple times even, I guess towards the end of the season, I'd even see students heading towards right Fenway with a cap on their heads and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Maybe one of them but, was me. Maybe I blended <laughs> in as a, maybe I looked like a student. There you go. As I walked to the to the game. So let's let's shift and talk about Enron. Yeah, for a sure. Bit. So like I said, I saw this play that was basically a slam piece. Was it the Lucy Preble play? No. Okay. I don't think so. Um, but it was it was called Enron mm-hmm. and it was uh, put on by the National Arts Center and basically it it said that these people were crooks. Yeah. Basically. With no nuance to it. It was like they were bad people mm-hmm. who just wanted to make money, have sex, do drugs, rock on. Right. Do your thing. And my, my initial reaction was like it was way over the top mm-hmm. and it was way too long. It was like two hours <laughs> and 45 minutes. Yeah. It's too long. Like a slam piece you could do in 20 minutes. Like right. Everyone knows Enron is sort of this infamous company. Mm-hmm. But for you, to study it academically, was that challenging given the preconception that most people, I think, have about Enron? Like, were you, was it possible for you to approach this project completely unbiased? Yeah, it was, it was a challenge. I think one, I mean, my initial interest in it, so I, my academic trajectory is a little odd. I got a master's degree in English, and I wrote my master's thesis on financial nonfiction journalism from the from the 80s. Mm-hmm. So things like Liar's Poker, which is a Michael Lewis book. Right. So I was already interested in the way in which sort of business is remembered um, and rendered in terms of popular culture and popular writing. So that was my initial interest in Enron was, well, I, got, I have to write about that just because there's so much. And when I got to UT, uh, which is a much more interdisciplinary program, and that department, the American Studies department, is really tightly connected with the, the history department there. And so I felt, um, felt myself being sort of pulled towards history and not wanting to think just about those books, but then sort of delving in mm. to the actual past of the company and the record. But yeah, it took a little while before you start saying, like, you start seeing these these different these different sort of takes on the company or you see the decision making in real time, which in retrospect just seems purely crooked. Right. You start to see this logic, mm-hmm. which in some ways I think is actually more disturbing. That it makes, that it kind of makes sense. Yeah, kind of. It's still, even from the retrospect of, you know, looking back now, mm. so much of it, you think, well, like, why did they, th-? like, that's so obviously a really bad idea. But if you think of, once you sort of submerge yourself in the language of the time, business culture of the time, sort of prevailing economic thought, Mm -hmm. prevailing political culture, all of a sudden, a lot of it, you can see how smart people who never set out to be criminals 
mm, drifted into right. this this thing. And at the most sort of generous, some of these uh, books and plays and movies will talk about sort of the internal culture and this idea of mm. perverse incentives. And in fact, right. that's when management scholars write about it. They all talk a lot about this right. sort of corruptive, corrosive uh, internal mm. culture, which is definitely part of it. But I think the connection with a broader business culture um, and vocabulary and ethos pushing mm. the company a certain direction is is definitely a part of it. Right. So because with the financial collapse mm-hmm. uh, in 2008, yeah. like, you must have looked at that and sort of seen some of the information coming out and been like, this seems very familiar. Yeah. Like the corporate culture that surrounds a lot of these banks, financial institutions, was present at Enron. As well, was it was it not? Yeah, and they recruited from at, towards the end of Enron's life. They were they considered their closest competitors for recruits, mm. uh, Wall Street banks. Right. So they were definitely recruiting from the same people, and um, yeah, it's the same. I think a well. First off, I mean, you know, the financial crisis is a million different things sort of contributing to it, but increasingly complex derivatives. Mm. are really what's sort of driving, like sort of multiplying the risk in the system. And Enron is a company that's really transformed by derivatives trading and Mm -hmm. sort of increasingly financialization of all these processes. So yeah, you definitely... You definitely saw the the parallels there right. for sure. So but, if if we just back up uh, just mm-hmm. just a hair, just so everyone is on the, is, is knows sort of the basic story that yeah. Enron is at its core supposed to be an energy company. Yeah, and it gets involved in these derivatives investments, basically, right? And, and is that sort of the case that it does, it sort of strays from being purely an energy yeah. company. Enron begins life uh, in 1985. Uh, there's two natural gas com- natural natural gas pipeline companies. So mm-hmm. natural gas for much of the 20th century is segmented into three different parts. And transportation, which are the gas pipelines, are one part of it. So there's Houston Natural Gas, which is where Ken Lay is after sort of bouncing around Washington D.C. and actually Florida, so Florida gas for a while, and finally. Um, in Houston, ends up as the head of Houston Natural Gas. At the same time, there's InterNorth, which is based in Omaha, Hmm. Nebraska. Uh, This is a time of great merger and acquisition activity in uh, in natural gas. And so they combine um, for a variety of strategic reasons. And when they do, they're the largest pipeline system in the U.S., that coincides with the deregulation um, of the industry, which had been this sort of ongoing process that really gets going underway in the late 70s. Right. But ultimately what happens is they take this really stable system of set prices, a really easy way to run the gas thing, and basically said, you guys are now, instead of transporting, basically buying gas at a set price, transporting it and selling it, you guys are sort of, we're lifting the cap on the price Mm -hmm. so the price can float now and you guys are going to be open access carriers so people can contract to sort of push gas through you um that changes things drastically um and it becomes a much more complex system and while all these gas companies are trying to figure out how to do that jeff skilling who at that point he's an smu alum Mm -hmm. actually in a harvard business school alum too (laughs) um and portrayed not in a very good way in this play. No, never portrayed in a very good way. Um, he's a consultant for McKinsey at that point, and he's someone who's interested in finance in general, but he comes along, or he, it's attributed to him, he basically figures out you can use this system in a way that's really, really profitable. So he comes up with this way, if you want to sell long-term contracts to end users for gas at a set price, so they don't have to worry about a fluctuating uh, spot market. So there's that part that's in a way that's basically like locking in a contract. It's almost like a forward right. contract. All that kind of, well, no, right. um, well, people do that with mortgages but, a lot. You, you take yeah. a 10 year fixed term. Yeah, exactly. Sort of so thing. you, like, you get these long term contracts yeah. setting up and then he's going, it's almost like, and it's like buying bulk, right? Like that's why we buy bulk. Yeah. Like I have to- I buy a toilet paper for a year and right. I get a cheaper price than if I bought, you know, a four pack. So, so he's, right. yeah, so he's, he's doing that. 
And at the same time to get gas, he comes up with this system called the volumetric production payment where he's going to gas producers, which are, for a variety of reasons, strapped for cash and basically pays for gas that's not extracted yet um, at a set price. And Enron's actually even bankrolling and financing these companies, which is really important. They're buying this gas Mm -hmm. um, and they've set it up in a way that if these companies actually go bankrupt... Enron can go in and just extract the gas themselves. Right. So they, they're getting this access to this, all of this gas. They're paying for it up front. And then they're selling, they're selling it to these companies where the, the benefit is obvious, where you're sort of, you've locked in a price over 10, right. 20 years. So that's basically the model. And they've got this extensive network and they can do it. And so the financialization really begins there. And one way in which that, which they're doing that is, all right, so you've got, Enron paying these gas producers up front, mm-hmm. but their money is coming in slowly. So how do you sort of get around that? Right. They do it in a couple of different ways. One, he brings in an investment banker from Continental Bank in Illinois named Andy Fastow, who had been used to securitizing mortgages and all this kind of stuff, and basically pools all of, all of the stuff into a special purpose entity, entity, which is basically a shell corporation, which is called the Cactus Fund. And then you can issue securities. So the, the money that's basically coming in, the revenue is sort of collecting in this mm-hmm. thing. And then you can sell securities to investors. So you get the money up front. So he securitizes this whole sort of sort of thing. That's kind of the beginning of, of all of that. And then another sort of thing that they're doing, which is really portentous, is their accounting method. They're using mark-to-market, which is something that financial companies do all the time where the asset price will move around a lot, they're constantly making these adjustments. So they're actually mm-hmm. doing that to sort of saying like, well, we signed this contract and even though the money hasn't been realized yet, this is how much this is worth and so we're booking the profit now. So all of that's right. happening. Right. That quickly expands into not just long-term contracts, but offering a bunch of different derivatives products to end users. So you can create, you can buy like forward contracts from them, you can pay like swap options where you're sort of, dealing with almost just like settling accounts of balances versus the spot rate versus right. these sort of fixed rates and all this kind of stuff. So it becomes really complex really, really fast. That works well in natural gas. Mm-hmm. Everything's sort of going great. And in fact, the industry is moving, moving that way anyway. In fact, um, forwards contracts are already beginning to trade around the same time on the New York Mercantile Stock, Mercantile Exchange. So the financialization of the industry is already underway a bit. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, Enron has competitors. Around the same time, for a variety of reasons, there's sort of a push towards electricity, wholesale electricity right. trading, which is, makes perfect sense for Enron, uh, especially once, uh, as part of the 1992 Energy Act, you can, you can basically, natural gas companies can be exempt from an old New Deal era law, which would have prevented them from dealing in electricity. So they get into that. So that kind of makes sense. That's what gets them into California, which is this huge fiasco. Right. So there's this skilling has created this sort of like trading financial sort of side of it. At the same time, Enron's like any other multinational company with projects around the world mm-hmm. and thinking about power plants in different places and emerging markets and all that kind of stuff. That creates this inherent tension. And then once you get to the uh, to skip a lot of stuff, just mm-hmm. to um, once you get to the second half of the '90s especially with the rise of Silicon Valley and the new economy, uh, you can see this in Skilling's language. He starts thinking about Enron not as an energy company uh, or an electricity power company, but more of a company that has mastered the art of making money out of networks. Right. And this is around the same time network is becoming just this... Buzzword. Exactly. Everyone wants one. So yeah. it suddenly becomes Enron's core competency is in the energy business. It's manipulating networks. Right. And that's what leads it into all of these different things. Which is what I really don't understand because at its core, if you're supposed to be an energy company, why, what's wrong with being an energy company? Yeah. Like in making money, being an energy company. And, and it's one of these things that I, I don't really understand generally. And it seems like a lot of companies do this where they expand beyond what they're good at 
or even what their their initial purpose was to be. Yeah. And it just gets too large. And they do, instead of doing one thing really well, Mm -hmm. they do a lot of things mediocre. And in the case of Enron, things Mm -hmm. completely collapse in on themselves and people go to jail. But it's based on this, to me, a business principle of expand, expand, expand. And that if you make the same amount of money in 2015 that you did in 2014, that's Mm -hmm. not good. Even if you yeah. made a billion dollars, because you're not growing. Yeah. It's this mentality that you always have to be growing. So there's definitely this sort of growth part of it, which is, again, if you, I mean, it goes back to sort of corporate control. And if you read like analyst reports and should you, you know, what's going on with this company's stock, it, there's there's a huge amount of discourse and chatter around publicly traded companies and what are they doing. So it's not like the, the sort of push to grow is like this id sort of urge towards grow. I mean, there's this, there's a, there's an apparatus sort of pushing mm-hmm. companies in that direction. In terms of like expanding and all that stuff, what I think is really interesting, especially in Enron's case, is it's almost like a re-expansion after a drastic recalibration in the late 1980s. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of U.S. companies, uh, gas companies diversified. So there's this moment when gas companies, just like other companies, are conglomerates. So there's Mm -hmm. this idea that um, you're not focusing on one specific business, that you're you're growing, but sort of combining businesses that aren't necessarily related to one another. Right. It's almost a form of hedging. Yeah, it's exactly a form. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely it is. And then, but in the 80s, that sort of really, and Wall Street is really pushing this, is saying like, we're going to break these companies up. We're going to make them leaner. It's a return to your core competency. And you can see that even in in Enron's uh, sort of rededication at the end of the 1980s. Ken Lay is saying, like, we're going to become a leaner corporation. After that combination of Internorth and, and Houston Natural Gas, they're shedding lots of these other businesses that they had yeah. owned. What's interesting is the sort of re-expansion at the end of the 90s um, comes because Skilling thinks of their core competency not as not as energy. Mm. Um, so from from that logic, Enron wasn't reconglomerating at all. Right. It was actually it was really doubling down on that kind of uh, mm. idea of we do one thing really really well. Right. Right. But, so so then what is that precipitous moment that brings it all down? I vaguely recall reading something about the whistleblowers, the Enron whistleblowers, Mm -hmm. that they actually got into some trouble uh, because they were whistleblowers. Uh, But really, what is what sort of is that moment that things start to come to a head for Enron? Like I was saying earlier, sort of the mechanisms for the fraud are put in a place really, really early. Most people place that slide into fraud because it is sort of a gradual slide around 1997. Mm. Um, but what starts happening is this sort of special purpose entity securitization that was really critical f- for the gas bank to function. Which, which uh, sorry, I should backtrack. Skilling basically called this whole system he set up the gas bank. So securitization through special purpose entity, entities was a really, really important part of that. That process gets really out of control, you know, especially in the second half of the nineties. And especially as they expand, like at one point they try to get into broadband, they're going to do the same thing with broadband. That business doesn't take off. So they'll, they'll basically take those failing parts of the business and put it in a special entity so they don't have to realize those, pro- you know, right. those problems for a while. So they're doing that. Once they're doing that, their cash problem was never solved. So they're, they're constantly, just to keep operating, sort of borrowing money, too. Mm-hmm. So that process really, really gets out of control. And a lot of these are also derivatives deals, like stashed in, in some of these, these different things. So as that, that sort of comes to a head as well, and you'll sort of prop up one with another one and right. all of that kind of stuff. Right. The funny thing, though, is if you look at the internal documents... They're not sort of saying we're really pulling one over or, geez, we're really in trouble. They're talking about syndicating assets, saying, like, we don't, you know, we don't want to be tied to physical assets. We need money now, so we're going to financialize them. Right. Or we're being sort of innovative with our financing. We're being flexible with our financing, all this kind of stuff. 
So the again, sort of people ask, why did the board approve all of this stuff? Well, on one hand, the board seems to have considered really complex things really briefly, which is kind of shocking. <laughs> but beyond that, uh, the language in which everything is couched, it just seems like, well, this is fantastic. And so you kind of move on from it. Right. Um, eventually it becomes a problem, like a real problem. Skilling abruptly resigns in August 2001, which is sort of an interesting moment around the time that an accountant named Sharon Watkins sort of sees what's going on and gets nervous about it. Now, in her own personal narrative that she's published, she'd worked at, I'm blanking on the company now, some other company that had actually faced a, an accounting scandal. Mm-hmm. So she really worries about it and writes this anonymous letter to Ken Lay and says, we need to, you need to sort of clean this stuff up. These losses are going to happen one way or the other. Just get rid of them now. Um, part of the logic is, well, you know, it's kind of a chaotic time right now because the CEO just abruptly left. So let's just clean house now and move on. Mm-hmm. He agrees. So in October 2001, during a quarterly an- analyst report, they say what they're going to do is unwind a lot of these deals and just take take the hit and move on from there. That hit is a billion dollars. <laughs> so he goes and he goes and is sort of going through the script and all these people are on the conference call and he just sort of blithely mentions that we're taking a one they call it a non-recurring charge. <laughs> Basically <laughs> means a lot. And interestingly and and the, I lo- this never gets reported but I love this. There's Actually, lines got crossed on the conference call. So at one point, there's just this confusion where somebody thinks he's on a call with someone else, and then oh, finally they figure it all out again. <laughs> but, you know, so that's kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. And the Wall Street Journal starts sort of picking up on it and reporting. So more questions happen about this loss and what happened. The funny thing, though, is it's not like any of it's a secret. If you read after Skilling leaves, analyst reports basically saying... Enron has to clean up its finances. So it's not like people didn't know that there were these things out there. Um, But it raises more questions. So there's more scrutiny suddenly on a lot of these special purpose entities. Um, At the same time, sort of the the stock is sort of going down. Uh, It had been going down all year, but it really starts to plummet as sort of more questions emerge. Finally, they go back and they're going to clean house even more and issue this other statement. And they notice this accounting glitch um, which I still haven't decided if this is like intentional fraud or if it's in some cases or if it's just the co- the financing was so convoluted they don't know. But technically with these special purpose entities, at least 3% um, of the money coming into them has to come from outside. Okay. So it has to be from somewhere else. So they were getting this stuff, but to get that money in, they were like guaranteeing, they were basically borrowing money in in a roundabout way. Okay. Um, so someone basically says, well, you know what? We actually, you know, we need to re-report all the stuff. So they re-report stuff going back to 1997. So this is 2001 at this point. Um, and they basically cut their profitability in half. So all of a sudden, this like phenomenal financial story of like business genius and stuff yeah. it just looks bad. Mm-hmm. And once that happens, the stock goes further. The Wall Street Journal is relentless in its publishing. Um, their credit downgrades. Once credit downgrades happen, it triggers like debt obligations. So suddenly, like cash is flying out the door in that way. Mm-hmm. And um, long story short, by uh, December, they're they're done, and they're briefly the largest corporate bankruptcy in U.S. history. Mm. I say briefly because WorldCom in 2002 right. instantly <laughs> dwarfs it, but a long time in the making, but a relatively swift. Collapse. Right, right. Once things start to unravel, yeah, it just goes. It's sort yeah. of like a, a snowball. Yeah, right. As the snowball effect, it just sort of happens. Yeah. And and one of the things that and, and you've sort of mentioned this that you are really interested is in the internal language, internal mm-hmm. culture that goes along with this. And I think most people, when they would think of Enron, they would think of it as this sort of criminal yeah. thing that happened. But you sort of alluded to it that you're not really sure that if some of these things were intentional fraud or if it was this system that was set up with perhaps good intentions or at least not criminal intentions yeah. that was just got out of control and, and people didn't really know how to rein it in in the moment. 
So how, when you're looking through the documents, mm-hmm. how does the language reflect that? And at any point, is there an ambivalence towards what's going on internally in the language? You, you definitely see some ambivalence. I, I should also be clear. There's some stuff that is just plainly fraudulent. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. So, right. um, so it's not, it's not all... But, it's not... Like, it's not all the case of you look at it and you're like, well, I'm not sure. Yeah. Like, no, there's some like, stuff that's clear. Yeah, exactly. So Andy Fast has a perfect example. Like, he had basically set up, um, at one point, they had set up this special purpose entity. So it's like this distinct corporation on paper that's supposed to negotiate with Enron, which people say, like, like why did they waive the sort of conflict of interest requirements? Was Andy Fast now was going to be the chief financial officer of Enron, but at the same time, the general managing partner of this thing that was supposed to be negotiating with Enron. And how the hell can you do that? And so there is this huge amount of ambivalence over that. There's a whole discussion eventually that they waive those requirements. So Fastow finds himself in this fantastic position. Well, when he's investing his own money in this other firm, he's, he personally is profiting like fabulously. Hmm. Which is so clearly, for, you know, yeah. For, you can't do uh, that. Yeah, so that stuff's happening. But when you when you look at that stuff, where people say like, why would the board of directors allow that to happen? Well, uh, if you look at the sort of language that gets used in presentations, they talk about setting up an internal marketplace. Right. And if you think about the sort of broader context of uh, the market as this perfectly democratic instrument, which is this sort of great equalizer. That's sort of a broader discussion. This idea of an internal marketplace suddenly makes like, well, that's brilliant. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, that's actually more sense, yeah. exactly more honest. Mm. So you see these weird slippages of language like that. Here's another example. Arthur Anderson, which was the accounting firm, which was supposed to be doing auditing for the firm's books, uh, but was also operating as basically a service provider. Enron was was a huge client. Mm. That seems like a huge conflict of interest. Right. So that gets raised in front of the board. Well, it's called uh, an integrated audit, which you mm. think about the language of Silicon Valley. Right. Suddenly, that suddenly seems like this like brilliant thing as well. Right. So you see stuff that, in retrospect, seems just like really bad ideas, invitations to fraud... Um, at the time, are couched in this language that seems like it's really forward-thinking and and sort of more with the times. And I think it's all part of this broader business discourse you see in the 90s, which really views, it sort of says like we're in this sort of new global world, Mm -hmm. old rules don't apply anymore. So suddenly crazy ideas seem really good. And there's this idea of like, well... Why don't we try what used to work? And there's just this larger ethic of, while we're in this fundamentally new era, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. That's, that's where the folly really lies. And in some ways, Enron's experience sort of measures up. I mean, Skilling did, did this really interesting thing in the late 80s when he looked at this one business and said, we can actually apply the principles from this other part of the economy to this business. Right. That's so, really smart and interesting. Right. And, and, and so, kind of innovative in its, in its own way. Right. Absolutely. Which um, is sort of in, in the way it's practiced is where it gets in trouble. I, it just it got... It just got too big. It get, yeah, it got, it got too far afield. Um, mm-hmm. But that original sort of gas, gas bank idea was, was really, really smart. Right. Now, one of the, the more interesting debates I had over the course of the this, this semester with mm-hmm. some of my students was this notion of responsibility and who's responsible for, for certain things and mm-hmm. when. And one of the students made, the, made a comment that, you know, in 2007, if you worked for a big bank that was doing these, these hedge funds type things, mm-hmm. and when things collapse, like you bear some of the responsibility for what happened because you're contributing... To that system, and I thought it was really interesting because if you were like a bank teller at Bank of America, mm-hmm. like I, don't, I, I would argue that you're sort of exempt from being responsible for yeah. the the mortgage situation and and all that kind of stuff. With respect to Enron, mm-hmm. you have lots of employees and people who are going in every day doing their job, yeah, who suffer from what happened, yeah, in two thousand one. 
when you look at those people and the language they use, mm -hmm. is there a marked change in how they understood their jobs and themselves from before and after everything happens? And are they conscious in through 97 to 2001 you know, if I'm going in and I'm literally just responsible for making sure the gas gets to where the gas is supposed to go, mm -hmm. that's my job. Yeah. Are they aware of these troubles that are sort of brewing underneath the surface? I mean, I think some had to have been. Mm -hmm. What I think is interesting, though, is when skilling arrives and when his model really takes off, you look at who they're 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 hiring different people. Right. So they're not hiring people who traditionally would have ended up in the, the gas business. They're competing with investment banks for recruits. And in fact, there's this really fascinating ad campaign where they're just trying to make Houston seem like this wonderful place. And wouldn't you rather live in Houston than New York or London or right. wherever? And actually, yeah. the Enron Field is totally a part of that effort to sort of make Houston this exciting place for mm -hmm. people who are mobile. So you get the sense that Probably not. You've like young young people. Enron's being taught in business schools. Fortune magazine is lavishing praises on them. No, there, I, you get the sense that probably not. The interesting thing is, right after the company collapses, they set up this website uh, laid off one guy um, where he's trying to like hawk T-shirts of like you know drawings of Ken Lay behind bars <laughs> and stuff like that. But it also sort of becomes this little bit of a forum for students to like push out new i like new ideas. And so the language of entrepreneurialism and mm -hmm. are we innovative still is circulating among these, these Enron employees. Interesting. So I think one of the interesting things about Enron is I think the ethos basically survives. And even though a lot of the employees were angry, of mm -hmm. course, with the company and, and what happened. Some of the 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 culture remained like they didn't eschew the culture entirely. No, which is really quite remarkable. Yeah, given how angry a lot of people were. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and there's definitely an anger, and there's also an anger because some people were just summarily fired, and some mm. people were retained and actually paid retention bonuses. Right. So there's this really weird split. And if you look at that, you can the website's gone now, obviously, but like um, archive.org has a bunch of those pages. They set up this thing called the Enron Relief Front, Relief Fund, where they're basically mm -hmm. pressuring employees who are still there to contribute some of their bonus money to the right. people who were laid off. And so there's definitely an anger. And if you read some of the emails, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely this anger, this feeling that they've been had, mm -hmm. but it's not as if it was this like they weren't like radicalized and turned into yeah. you know <laughs> a bunch of Marxists or anything like right. that. Now even. When I was in grad school, I did a few oral histories with former employees. I quickly stopped, though, because it's like their reaction is fascinating on its own. I was getting lots of stuff from the movie or mm. the books yeah. and lots of, well, I should have known this. So there's this weird mix of pride on the one hand of having worked there. Um, I think for some people, not all people, but some people, it was a really good experience. Mm -hmm. There was a sense that... At, the, um, among the people I talked to, they all landed on their feet. So it wasn't like, right. you know, their, lives, their lives weren't necessarily destroyed. No, like they didn't but, somewhere, but yeah. Right. But, but then again, that was also a self-selecting, you know, the people I was able to contact were young, who, younger. So right. they, they, you know, they lost money in their 401ks, but it wasn't mm -hmm. this devastating sort of nearing retirement kind of loss. Right. Yeah. If you had started with the company when you were 45 years old. Yeah. And right when it started in 1985, you get mm -hmm. to 2001, you're 61. Yeah. You're sort of en at least conscious of the end of your work life. Yeah. Thinking towards retirement. And then if this all falls apart, then... So then there you go. I, I actually will say, though, towards the end, so they brought in, after Skilling leaves, they bring in Frank Lutz, who's a, who does a lot of polling for the Republican Party. And he conducts a survey of uh, employees and what he finds actually is like right about before the company collapses actually like morale is really really low mm. and some people are saying like we're we're crooked and mm. uh so there is this like festering cynicism towards the end i it's it's a, the employee reaction i think is actually you can't characterize it saying it's definitely this way or that way it's mm. it's much more Very mixed yeah it is mixed mm. 
So one of the things that I think yeah. a lot of people talk about with Enron mm-hmm. is, and you mentioned it earlier, the lack of regulation. And yeah. The deregulation that, that happens. But in listening to you talk about the language that's being used, mm-hmm. that some of this language would probably get by regulators too, would it not? Like this this idea of that they're innovative and that they're being... Uh, they're integrating like these this sort of language would yeah. that not also get around certain regulations that it's like it's not that they're trying to necessarily hide fraud mm-hmm. at least early on yeah that they're just sort of building and, and trying to try new things yeah and, and isn't that kind of the point of business to a certain degree yeah it's interesting so the the relationship with with regulators especially it's it's easy to document in the early part of the 90s um, it's just a different conversation, but it's still there. So one of the big things they need is first they need um, from the Securities and Exchange Commission this permission to use mark-to-market accounting. So they send this this packet to them, and they basically make this long argument saying, "Look, this part of our business is really not like a traditional gas business. We're really much more like a bank." And so. You know, they're not couching it in this, in sort of the, the language of innovation or integrated mm-hmm. audit or financial flexibility, but they are making a really sustained argument that says our business is much more like a bank. Right. Uh, which is really interesting. Um, and then if you look when Ken Lay, uh, who is politically connected, is pushing George H.W. Bush for things in the early 90s when he was president. He's couching a lot of stuff in the language of environmentalism, which is super fascinating to me. And that's been actually forgotten um, okay. in a lot of in a lot of ways. But he's saying, you know, if we do this, you know, it's really going to be. I know you've got these environmental goals, and you know, this really matches up well with it. And you know, natural gas is going to be like a bridge fuel. Mm-hmm. So it's um, like a synergy between environmentalism and like business and energy interests. Because George H. W. Bush. Who's an energy guy? Yeah, like the whole yeah, Bush was, family is, uh-huh. right? So is this a way to sort of is that how it's being presented? Then, like you get people from the the left, the environmentalists, people from the right, these oil guys, bringing them together. Well, I think the '90s, around the time of uh, the 20th anniversary of Earth Day, sort of coincides with this sort of new round of globalization after the fall mm-hmm. of the Berlin Wall. I feel like these nascent understandings of globalization, uh, which coincide with a growing awareness of global warming and all this. All this kind of stuff. It's inherently environmental. Right. In some ways. And so you have things like the 1992 Rio de Janeiro, like Brazil Earth Summit, which is this UN meeting, which is a precursor to eventually the Kyoto Protocol and beyond. So there's this sense that we have to deal with this stuff somehow. But it's also this moment when it seems like the market has, is just the way to do things generally. Mm-hmm. It seems like that old sort of idea of competing economic systems is basically over right. and that sort of language of the market and incentives for business and all that kind of stuff really infuses bush's language but it presents an opening for lay there's a, this great letter where he sends to bush sort of really pushing him for certain things and he says you know i'm not convinced the earth's going to boil mm-hmm. um i don't really know about climate change but you know what like it's really not going to hurt if we do this well he's saying that of course because he can make the case. And in fact, the um, AG, the American Gas Association around this time, is actually making the same sort of case that, mm-hmm. hey, we're relatively environmentally friendly. Right. And that idea sort of moves forward even into the Clinton era where Lay sort of hopping on the President's Council on Environmental uh, Sustainability. Mm-hmm. A lot of their big power plant projects in the, in the mid-90s are couched in terms of environmental responsibility mm-hmm. and clean energy production and all this kind of stuff. And, and the, would that mm-hmm. also help then with regulation? Like the, yeah. Oh, the, yeah. You're yeah. presenting yourself in this way that, well, then maybe the regulations don't need to be as stringent. Like, yeah, strict, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in fact, that's one case Lay makes repeatedly is that if natural gas is allowed to sort of compete fairly with coal or if you remove protection of the coal, mm-hmm. wow, things are really going to right. take off. So, yeah, there's really a sense of if natural gas is given a free hand, Mm -hmm. this is going to be nothing but good for the environment. Right. Uh, What's interesting is that language and that ethos, like, totally disappears uh, by the end of Enron's life. And it's much more about innovation and excitement. Mm -hmm. And I 
Um, some of that, I think, is because just the, the language of business changes. But if you read analyst reports from the first half of the 90s, they'll talk about innovative schemes like skillings, um, great leadership team. The idea of environmentalism never really comes up. So mm-hmm. from Wall Street's perspective, I don't think those environmental concerns were ever a part of their equation mm-hmm. for whether Enron is a buy or a hold stock. Okay, so um, it's, it's really just these other things, which then would lead back to this idea of regulation. Of mm-hmm. How do you re- even regulate a company like this? Yeah. Because you have regulations for oil and gas. Mm-hmm. You have financial regulations. I don't know how much those two things overlap, but the company is doing both of these things. Yeah. And so, so when you're talking about when they're dealing with regulators, who exactly are they dealing with? It really depends, especially once you get to... So energy deregulation is that... So Early on, sort of, if you look at like energy companies in the early 20th century, they they were like a target for New Deal legislation. They were like boondoggles in a lot of ways and stuff like that. So the separation of Enron being a gas company that's not allowed to also do things with ener like electricity mm-hmm. is part of this New Deal legacy of keeping that industry segmented. Right. The sort of push towards allowing exemptions from that Public Utility Holding Company Act, PUCA is part of the 1992 Energy Policy Act. So um, that's sort of weird, like, well, maybe we can sort of make an exception for certain companies is starting to ramp up. What's interesting, though, is that once you get to, once Enron decides, well, electricity wholesale trading is, like, way bigger than natural gas, and that's really where we need to be. What they really want to happen is, like, with natural gas... FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, is sort of enacting these rules, which is sort of deregulating the country. Mm. Like, you know, one big nationwide deregulation, and right. another one, states have to deregulate uh, their energy system, their electricity systems. So they're sort of courting states, like, on an individual basis, which is a maddening process for Enron. So they're making different, different pitches to different states. Right. And eventually, if they get one big success in one state, they're going to sort of use that as, as like a sort of model to point mm-hmm. to. And for them, it's California. And right. so they make lots of pitches to California. And that becomes a massive disaster. And when the California energy crisis happens in 2000, 2001, if you look at Enron's internal literature, and even some speeches Ken, uh, not Ken Lee, but Jeff Skilling are making, it's a defense of re- deregulation as a principle almost mm. because Enron's fate is really tied to tied to a lack of regulation. The derivatives contracts, which are like let you hedge against risk, especially yeah. you know price risk, they don't really make sense in a regulated environment where things are set. So you kind of yeah. need if you're peddling risk management or peddling sounds dismissive, but if you're selling risk management products you kind of need a risky environment. So right. yeah. that's, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's what, that's what you say. When like when you think of these things almost on a micro level, mm-hmm. a lot of them make, make sense. Yeah. But in the macro, when you look at it as a whole, it doesn't. Yeah. And that's really quite, quite fascinating. And uh, I guess just the last thing I would ask, mm-hmm. how much of the Enron story is emblematic of or related to just the 90s? In general, and and yeah, I wasn't. I don't think old enough to really be conscious of the economic situation in the 1990s, mm-hmm. but it's remembered at least or talked about as being a very prosperous time. Yeah, the economy was good, and people were making a lot of money doing big things. And and was this company, was this growth, associated with the 90s and the culture of the 90s of, of constantly growing and pushing for more? I think so. I think what was interesting, and I think the biggest thing to wrap my head around is because Enron falls apart on George W. Bush's watch and because there are these demonstrable ties between Ken Lay and the Bush family, although they, I don't, they're, not, they're not insidious, though, mm. but, um, but they're there for sure. Right. You know, it gets taught as, or it gets remembered as this sort of part of this like Bush-era boondoggle. Mm-hmm. But in some ways... Out of the three presidents Ken Lay operated under, I guess Reagan too, but I, you know. But in terms of Bush, Clinton, and then Bush too, it's George W. Bush actually had the least relationship. And there's this like instant distancing themselves sure. in a way that with Clinton, there was more of an interchange. Mm-hmm. So there's, I think Enron's really tied up with 
the 90s as this moment in which distinctions, be, economic distinctions between left and right are like blurred, basically. And there's a sense that there's sort of a, an optimism in the market is sort of providing things and we're all sort of hurtling into this new era. Um, Enron's definitely a part of that. Mm-hmm. And, and then actually the, the one thing too that the play kind of references mm-hmm. and does it in this really weird symbolic way that I didn't care for was September the 11th. And yeah. And that that, I think the play argues that that contributed to how quickly everything unraveled because people were so uncertain as to what was going on economically following 9-11. Yeah. And there was more scrutiny on, on certain things. And, and maybe people were a lot more risk-averse in all aspects of life following mm-hmm. that. And that contributed to to what happened and that unraveling. Would would you say that September the 11th like had anything to do with Enron? So there's, there's another dissertation out there that argues that like understandings of Enron, at least in political culture, are sort of super wrapped up in 9-11. Right. And I think there's something to that language that some senators use when Enron executives are being grilled, call, you know, calling them economic terrorists and stuff like that. Right. I, I don't think... I think Enron, it was going to collapse no matter what. I mean, there was that, that was sort of inevitable. If you look at like the way it's... It's remember, like in certain late night jokes, will sort of mi- you know mix the two. And mm-hmm. George Bush is in a secret location. It's because he doesn't want to answer questions right. about Enron. <laughs> Ken Lay makes this really just stupid comment, saying like, "Just like the country's under attack, we're under attack." Um, oh. What I do think is actually interesting is if you look, if you go into two thousand two, when Sharon Watkins is named as one of Times People of the Year along with other whistleblowers. And one of those other whistleblowers is someone, I'm blanking on the name now, but an FBI, employee, former FBI mm-hmm. employee. And so it's this saying basically like, you know what, like we're, we haven't made the changes to make us safer yet and all this kind of stuff. So I think there is this sort of, if you look at the early aughts as this time of intense anxiety mm-hmm. that 9-11 kind of ushers in, I think Enron's definitely a part of that. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't think that there's no connection between the actual events of the of, of Enron's collapse. It just sort of all happened around the same time, and so in, in memory, we it gets connected. Yeah, and, and even at the time, people are associating them, even though if they're independent acts. Yeah, the acts, everything is independent of each other. Yeah, but when people discuss them, they bring them together. I think briefly. I don't think even. You know, I don't think the way Enron's remembered now, I mean, and 9-11 doesn't come up. I think if right. you look at some of the yeah. documents, like immediately afterwards, there's just a general sense of sense of anxiety and right. we don't know what's coming next. Mm-hmm. And Enron contributes to that. And I think Enron in a time when, when 9-11 uh, makes Bush sort of invulnerable to a lot of criticism... Yes. Enron is a rare point of, well, we can really needle him on this. Right. And I think that's kind of interesting. Mm. But that even goes away relatively quickly. By the time you get around for Bush's reelection, he's even referencing Enron and look, we, you know, we got to like clean things, get, clean things yeah. up and stuff yeah. like that. So it's not, that doesn't even mm. really stick. It just sort of becomes the, the name Enron, this infamous thing, and it, but it doesn't necessarily stick to one person. I, I think or at it, least a, a political figure. I think it's 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 still it's still connected to Bush and Cheney, but it's not anything that like damages them their right. their fortunes even remotely. Right, and for both um, of them, like it's I, people like to talk about you know in, in your obituary, like mm-hmm. where is something going to come up? Like Enron wouldn't probably even be in an obituary for either of them. Probably not. Maybe Cheney more, you know. Lay is part of Cheney's, ta- you know, gets right. to advise Cheney's energy task force and stuff. But I mean, I've been to the Bush Library, which is on SMU's campus, and, right. and during you know, you go through the exhibit part, there's not a mention of Enron, hmm. and people can say, ah, oh, well, you know, all these. It's a way of uh, sort of whitewashing the past, writer. But in in a certain way, Enron happens. People around Bush realize he's vulnerable because of this family connection. They pretty much instantly stamp out, it's like, let, let Enron dies. They don't actually give any special favors to the company. Bush, it's sort of in a, he's, he died recently, but um, uh, Senator Oxley, or is it Sarbanes who died recently? Well, whatever. But one of them, in a, Michael Oxley, at least, in, a, um, in, a, in an oral history interview with uh, the Securities and Exchange 
uh, historical society, basically says, like, after Enron, like, there was a big push for some sort of law to pass. And Mm -hmm. Bush was one of those people saying, like, I want to sign something fast. So there's a sense of, like, distance neutralized immediately. And, in fact, if the irony of, I think, Bush and Enron is, you know, Bush was opposed to financial to campaign finance reform, right? Um, which had been sort of languishing the year before. Well, Enron's, you know, the revelations of Enron doling out money to all these different politicians, mm-hmm. um, suddenly that issue has new life. And Bush, who normally would have like vetoed that bill or lobbied against it, just stays out and just bites his tongue and signs the law when it comes mm-hmm. up to his desk. And Enron... Enron really forces his hand. So in a weird way... It all sort of ties it, back. It kind of. Yeah. And, and Bush is, in, in fact, in a weird way, he's the, the president, even though he's most associated with the company, has to, is the one who has to take actions against the company. Right. Um, right. And, of course, Bush's legacy is going to be remembered for... Other things. Other things. Other things. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Enron is a blip for him, and I think rightly so. Hmm. But hmm. well, it, it really is a fascinating story, and I fear we've only sort of scratched the surface on on everything. And, mm-hmm. and like I said at the, at the top, you have a contract with the University of Pennsylvania, and and working on the manuscript right mm-hmm. now. So the, a book will be forthcoming. And if you Google Gavin, you can find his academia page. Uh, there's a bunch of articles up there mm-hmm. that are open access that you can go in, look at them. One of my favorites, uh, at least the title, I really like the title of Electronic Bits and 10-Gallon Hats. Yeah, that's really, the name of the disc. I really like that title. The subtitle being Enron, American Culture, and Post-Industrial Political Economy. So you can go find all that stuff. You can find him on Twitter. He said he might start Twittering again. Yeah. You, you have it. It's just not necessarily active recently i understand the last the last tweet was about missing a flight Hmm. that no one retweeted that (laughs) so um and that was like two years ago i yeah but it's on my list of things to do right so you can find them and you clearly got on there somewhat early because your name is your handle it's at gavin banky banky Mm b-e-n-k-e and very few people have that with just their name, no underscore, no nothing. Like so, yeah. You you, you got the candle that you want. I've been sitting on it for <laughs> for, for years. <laughs> so that is, of course, Gavin Banky from Boston University. Thank you so much for doing. Well, thanks this. very much. If you have any questions or comments for the podcast, it's history slam at gmail dot com. Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.